Hello and welcome to the Core Preservation Week webinar on digital preservation's impact on the environment. I'm Sean Ferguson, a member of the Core Preservation Outreach Committee. I will be your host for today's webinar. Our presenter today is Linda Tadish. Linda is founder and CEO of Digital Bedrock, a managed digital preservation service that helps libraries, archives, museums, producers, studios, artists, and individuals preserve their digital content. She is also a lecturer in UCLA's Department of Information Studies, teaching a course on digital asset management. She was previously an adjunct professor in NYU's Moving Image Archiving and Preservation Program. Her over 35 years experience includes positions at HBO, ArtStore, the Media Archives and Peabody Awards Collection at the University of Georgia, and Pacific Film Archive. Linda consults and lectures on digital asset management, audiovisual and digital preservation, metadata, and the impact of digital preservation on the environment. She is a founding member and former president of the Association of Moving Image Archivists, AMIA, and is currently on the National Digital Stewardship Alliance, NDSA, Coordinating Committee. Linda is the recipient of the 2021 SMPTE James A. Lidner Archival Technology Medal. A few logistics for today's presentation. All attendees are muted to prevent background noise. You can utilize the Zoom chat function to comment or communicate with other attendees, but please use the Q&A box if you have any questions for our presenter or need technical support. We can only minimally monitor the chat. Our primary focus is to monitor the Q&A box. We will have time for questions after the presentation, and you may also comment on today's presentation using Twitter. The hashtag is Preservation Week 22. That's P R E S E R B A T I O N W E E K 22. We do not monitor the Twitter feed during the presentation, so if you have questions for our presenter, please type them into the Zoom QA. This webinar is being recorded, and you will receive an email with links to the recording and presentation slides shortly after the presentation concludes. CORE is committed to providing a harassment-free environment for everyone, regardless of gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, disability, physical appearance, ethnicity, religion, or other group identity. To that extent, all webinar participants, including speakers and attendees, must comply with the CORE Statement of Conduct. We will drop this link into the chat now. Please be sure to contact Miriam Nauenberg through private chat or email Julie Reese if you experience or witness any violations of the code. We will provide Julie Reese's email in the chat as well. And now, here is Linda. There will be a slight delay while we change presenters. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Sean, for the intro, and thanks to ALA Core for inviting me to present on this topic during Preservation Week. But mainly thank you to all of you who have taken an hour out of your day today to discuss this important conversation. Now, I'm going to stop my video so I can share my slides. We have a lot to cover today, so I'm really excited that they're going to be sharing slides, my slides with all of you. Okay, now, I assume I'm sharing my screen. Okay, all right, let's go. So, digital preservation and how your work impacts the environment. All of you have digital content. You are here participating in this, I'm assuming, because you, whether you're an individual, you have digital images yourself, you have digital video, you, might, um, you work at an organization, you have digital content that you must take care of. All of the actions that we take impact the environment. Now, storing and managing that digital content that you have, it intersects with the environment through greenhouse gas emissions. That's the obvious one that people think about, about all that energy use required to keep that content alive and to manage it. But there is also direct toxic endangerment to people, which people don't really discuss as much because all of that hardware, the video, audio, if you've digitized it, all that data storage media, it all becomes e-waste disposal. Not only, and where does it go? Not only is it e-waste, but also then to create all of that digital storage media depletes the earth's natural resources. So I'll be discussing that today. So at the end of this hour, hopefully you will be aware of how your individual 
and organizational actions manage and preserve in, in managing and preserving digital content could adversely impact the environment. And you will have ideas on how to change your practices that you can take back to your organizations and discuss with them. Now, you're all familiar with the terms the Jurassic period, where the dinosaurs were, the Permian period. Well, we are now in the Anthropocene epoch. And what this means is that it is human activity that is the main driver that impacts climate change. We are the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs. Basically, it's because of the increase in greenhouse gases that our activities are generating around the world for a couple of centuries going on now, is that this is going to cause an increase of two degrees centigrade or 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit, which will then result in extremely dangerous climate change of which we're already experiencing everything here on this list. We have a warmer ocean, which is killing the sea life, which means there's less food. We have melting ice, which means flooded coastal areas. Methane gas is being released from the melting permafrost. Methane is 28 times, releases 28 times more greenhouse gas emissions than CO2 does. There is severe weather through stronger hurricanes, cyclones, and droughts, which we are experiencing here in California. I should mention I am speaking to you from uh, Los Angeles in California. There is severe weather Again, again, as I'm sorry, I'm just repeating that. We have less potable water, which also means less food. There is starvation and suffocation. Think about the heat, wave, heat waves that happened last year around Europe and also even in the Pacific Northwest here. People were dying from the extreme heat. They couldn't breathe, it was just too hot. And we have climate refugees from human migrations trying to escape these situations. And we have wars where there will be countries fighting for these natural resources that are being depleted. You are probably familiar with the COP21 uh, meeting that happened in Paris in 2015, where leaders around the world decided, yes, we will create goals to, to not allow the global temperature to rise more than 1.5 degrees centigrade or 2.8 degrees Fahrenheit from pre-industrial era by the end of this century. But now in Glasgow, the meeting occurred again in 2021 last year. Now the goal is don't let it increase two degrees centigrade or 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit. However, as we just went through on that previous slide, this is resulting in extremely dangerous climate change. If it's at two degrees, we must take drastic steps to stop this within the next 10 years. Earlier this month, you might have all seen the headlines, the IPCC, which is the United Nations body that assesses the science, is all based on science related to climate change, released a pretty critical report saying like, we're not kidding guys, this is really critical. We don't, we don't have more than five to 10 years to stop this. So now the 22 reality is, the global temperature has already been raised by 1.1 degrees centigrade. It is impossible to keep it to no more than 1.5. That opportunity has passed us. We were supposed to, we're going to reach that already by 2030, just with things keeping going as they are now. We are in a climate emergency. And I encourage you all to go back and read at least some of the summaries of the IPCC report or the news about it so that you can understand that they're very long, extensive reports with a lot of good information. Um, but the summaries are also excellent to read. So with all of that depressing news, and so we think, what can we do? Now, as individuals, we are familiar with the term carbon footprint, which, is our, which basically is about our individual actions. Responsibility is on our shoulders, our personal choices. So what can we do? We do recycling, we take public transit, we try to buy electric vehicles where possible, installing solar panels. Of course, all of that requires money uh, for humans to do, to purchase all of this. And there are, so the, the climate change is adversely impacting poorer communities and communities with people of color because they're not going to go out, be able to install solar panels or buy electric vehicles. Now, though, we have to be aware that carbon footprint, that term, was propagated by the fossil fuel industry starting in the 1970s and on, basically propaganda to deflect its corporate responsibilities in greenhouse gas production, trying to say, no, nope, people, it's your fault. It's not us. It's your fault. We are having climate change. We have this problem. So another way to look at it is 
thinking about not just your carbon footprint as an individual, but what is your climate shadow, which reaches out beyond you and your actions as an individual, just for what your personal actions. This is a term I really like it that was coined last year in a blog by Anna Patti. And basically it's just like, it's not just your individual actions that you can do at home, but also then how do you discuss this with other people? How do you try to impact change in your workplace, in your archives? What do you do outside of your individual actions to try to combat climate change and to fight this climate emergency? So what I want to stress today is thinking about not just your individual actions, but how can you decrease your climate shadow by being more proactive at your organization? Because our archives do intersect with ICT, um, information communication technology, through the energy consumption and through the hardware use that's required to keep this digital content alive. So emissions that, CO2 emissions that come out from ICT is power, which is the obvious one, that would be the electricity that's on premise at your organization. Um, even if it's cloud storage, if you're using that, the, uh, it is still your content. You are responsible for it if you are using cloud storage. There is industry which is manufacturing the hardware that you're using, your servers, your computers. Surface transport is how do you get to work? So that's one way that we um, have greenhouse gas emissions. Your archives building constitutes the public buildings. You live somewhere, so that's the residential emissions and through aviation where you travel for business, for work, for conferences, your shipping materials by plane, that is where the aviation comes into play. Drilling into this more, and let's focus this back to what we are doing during this hour. So your computer, you're watching this on a computer perhaps, um, I'm doing, you know, I'm presenting this webinar from my laptop. So that is your end user device. So I'm using my laptop here at home. Then you have your telecommunication network, your streaming ISP provider. So I'm sitting here in Los Angeles in my house. Spectrum is our network ISP wi uh, Wi-Fi provider. So Spectrum is picking up the signal from my computer and it is zipping it over to a data center where Zoom is located in downtown LA. Out of that data center, then, the signal from Zoom is going out on the ISP from the data center out to your data centers, whatever is close to where you, the viewer, is participating and watching this, which then comes through your streaming to your computer. So this is like the circle of all the emissions that we are generating right now through this webinar. So it is expected over time that emissions from devices will decrease because you know, the, the manufacturers are making devices to be more energy efficient, but the data centers are going to increase just because there is so much data that is being stored and zipped around the planet. So again, let's talk about Zoom, what we're doing right now. So let's say that this presentation had been held in person in Chicago, and I bring up Chicago because that's the headquarters for the ALA. What would be my one person CO2 emissions if I flew from LAX to O'Hare? So there are these, and I'm really glad you're all going to be getting slides because there are some useful links in this. So the calculator link at the bottom. So if I flew round trip, my personal would be 440 kilograms or 970 pounds of CO2. Um, now, if now we're going to be, we are doing this now on Zoom, so I'm not traveling. So what are the CO2 emissions from this session held on Zoom? So as I had just explained, we are emitting CO2 right now. So using this other handy calculator, and I was assuming when I plugged it in saying, let's say there were 400, so it's a nice round number, participants, that's 452 kilograms or 996 pounds. That's roughly the equivalent of my round trip flight to Chicago if I had gone just for one person. So 400 people can participate, which would normally be the CO2 carbon impact if from my flight. Now, this is basically the equivalent of driving eight miles in a gas engine car. Just to put that in perspective, a typical passenger car emits 4.6 metric tons of CO2 per year. So bringing this all back now to the archives, the environment, um, Basically, you all already know that climate change can present dangers to your collections because there's heat and humidity that can cause mold on your objects, on your artifacts, and so it contributes to your collections deteriorations. The rising sea levels can cause flooding, 
It can overcome the land over time. And of course, we have the wildfires or tornadoes or hurricanes that can destroy buildings and collections. So considering that your physical collections are at risk just from the natural deterioration and end of life, especially if you have magnetic audio and videotape that is expiring really within the next couple of years, and climate change is placing all collections at risk. So archives are increasingly digitizing their collections for preserving and access, but you're also creating or receiving born digital content to store and preserve as well. So that is a lot of data that you have to take care of. But using these digital technologies do implicate archives in contributing to climate change. So we have this circular relationship. So the environment impacts our archives, but then we, the archives, also then impact the environment. So let's talk then about what the archives, what we can do to mitigate the environmental impact and how can we as individuals decrease our climate shadows. Digital content, as I mentioned, is created through reformatting or digitization of original analog or physical materials, and also as born digital files. Preserving all of that content will impact the environment through the legacy media destruction of the original media items. They'll be destroyed, most likely. They might go into landfills. Unfortunately, that's where most of them go. There is electricity use, which is the data, obviously, that has to be used to to preserve these objects and make them accessible. And the electricity use can use energy resources that can be dirty or clean. And then we have the e-waste destruction because the media and the hardware used to store and manage the data will be changed every five to 10 years. And the old e-waste can either be recycled, incinerated or dumped in a landfill. How much data are we even talking about? Well, it's estimated that by 2025, just in a few years, the amount of data being stored globally from all sectors around the world will reach 175 zettabytes, and half of that data will be stored in the public cloud. Now, of course, you're going to be migrating some of the legacy data that you have from obsolete media, and so that's going to add to the data storage tsunami. And there is not enough storage media to store all that data. We don't have enough. To handle it. The planet doesn't have enough raw materials to manufacture our current storage media forever and ever. Data storages don't last forever. And when their useful life is over, they're disposed of one way or another. Now, if you're a conservator, you have studied how paper and print and material objects are made. That helps you then to understand how they're made so that you can conserve them. Now for digital preservation, we are concerned about preserving the digital objects bits, not so much about what it's stored on. Um, but that data is going to be migrated from one storage medium to another throughout its entire life cycle forever and ever. So it is still important to understand how that storage media is made, which means understanding the global electronic supply chain. What are the storage media's energy and environmental requirements? Does that media have any reclamation or recycling potential? because this electronic storage media are made from the Earth's resources, which are not infinite. And that's what I want to get into in this next part. So electronics products, they have an initial service life, which is the original owner. That can last two to eight years, but manufacturers also build in an end of life as new models are released. After the initial service life, it can have a second service life, which would be after the from the original owner to the end of life, which can go five to 20 years. But at the end of all of that time, it's going to become e-waste. And then it's going to go either into the landfill, which unfortunately is where most of the e-waste goes. It can be incinerated, it can be recycled, or it can be exported to other countries, usually third world countries, out of sight, out of mind. E-waste can contain heavy and rare earth metals and plastic. So consider the recycling potential of your storage media and your devices. All of these devices are depleting the planet of its natural resources. They contain heavy and rare earth metals. Rare meaning like the earth created it, it's not like it can reproduce it. It's rare, once it's used, it's gone. And less than 1% of rare earth metals are currently recycled. And heavy metals themselves are toxic by their nature. So if the, these materials are just put into landfills, they can go down, they, as they uh, 
go underground, the, the toxins go into the groundwater, and then that enters us. There's also, besides those materials, there is silica sand. Silica sand is a specific kind of sand that is used to make electronics and glass. That is a finite natural resource. It's not like you can go out to the desert or just go to the beach and pull up sand to make this. It has to be a particular kind of sand. Helium is used to make hard drives to spin cooler and use less energy, which is a good thing that we want them to use less energy, but helium is also a finite natural resource. And we need purified water to make microchips. Water with droughts is being depleted, so then the efforts to purify it, there's less water than to make these microchips, which we actually experienced last year, which I'm going to get to in a second. So climate change and stripping the earth of its natural resources are each impacting the supply chain. Plastics are used in all of these electronics. Now, recycling plastic, because I'm sure you're all good about it and you try to recycle your, your plastic bottles and other things, is an established industry. However, plastics and computers and the servers and the phones, all of the other kind of plastics have different formulations. So the plastic parts must be separated for special recycling and processing. So look at this little green air cushion. You can see the recycling symbol there. It has a four in it. Well, if you put that into your blue bin for recycling, it's, you know, when it gets to the recycling center, they're going to toss it out because this requires a specific kind of recycling process. The, if it has a one or a two, that is what your recycling center is going to keep because that's usually going to be your bottles. Let's drill into the different data storage media and talk about how they're made and how they, if any parts of them can be recycled. There are three types of storage media carriers. There's spinning disk or hard drives. There's data tape, usually LTO, because that's the largest market share. And there is NAND or solid state drives. And the cloud, if you're using the cloud, is using a mix of all of these data storage carriers. Starting with spinning disk or hard drives, hard drives can be standalone sitting on your desktop or they can be uh, in servers. And servers will be using hard drives and solid state drives. The electricity used for these are high, the spinning disk. They have fans, they have to be kept at a certain temperature. Helium filled drives reduce energy use by 23%, but again, helium is a finite natural resource. The life expectancy for these are three to five years. There are potential recyclable parts. There are heavy metals in them again, but they are hard to get out. Manufacturers say, well, it's a bit, I was interviewing some of them for uh, these presentations and they basically say like, well, it's death by screws. It's really hard. They want to get, they want to reclaim that raw material because again, they're in the business of making these hard drives and they understand very well that there is going to be a shortage. There's only a finite amount of raw material they can use. So they want to reclaim it, especially the magnets. So they are doing a lot of R&D work to do this. Um, so they understand, they see the writing on the wall, but it is difficult to disassemble these. And so they calculate the cost to dissemble and recycle the raw materials versus just shredding it. If they can harvest any materials, they would get mainly aluminum substrate. That's the largest raw material, but it's the magnetic coating, the rare earth material. That's what they really want to get. So just to go through some of the promising efforts, all of this presentation isn't totally depressing. There are some efforts out there that manufacturers are trying to do. So Dell and Seagate, which is a hard drive manufacturer and Teleplan, they developed a method to scrape these rare earth metals and magnets from hard drives, and they have successfully started recycling them into new devices. So um, let's keep going. Now, if you have Dell uh, products, whether it's computers or hard drives or servers, you can get, you can recycle them. They, you can go to their website. It is an international program in case you're not in the US. So you can go to it and find out where to deliver your Dell products for international um, uh, locations. Now, Google, Google, which obviously works out of data centers, that's where they're operated, it is in their best interest to make sure that those data centers have hard drives that can spin their data. And this is an astonishing figure. 22 million hard drive disks age out at North American data centers every year. 22 million hard drives. So they would love to be able to recycle those hard drives. Now, these are enterprise hard drives that go into the servers, not consumer hard drives. 
So they are developing technologies just to go and, hey, data center, when your hard drives die, just we'll take them, we can reclaim them, and so then they can repurpose those materials. HP has a global consumer and business recycling program, also international. And Western Digital has a recycling program for hard drives and solid state drives. This is in the US only. It is really consumer oriented. There's a limit of five drives at any one time. But you can go to this site if you have your own personal drives that you'd like to um, recycle. So that's hard drives and some of the efforts made in trying to reclaim the data. Now let's talk to solid state drives or NAND flash memory. Now, the nice thing about flash memory is there are no moving parts, which means it also runs, runs cooler, um, but it has a short life expectancy. It really depends on the number of writes and data can fade. It can lose bits over time. So it's not a good archival storage medium. It is used mainly for processing data and applications. It does have recyclable parts, silicon and copper, although I am not familiar with any R&D efforts to really try to get that material out of these drives. So just to think about now about how solid state drives can burn up pretty quickly, uh, Chia cryptocurrency is one of the types of cryptocurrency. It is formulated based on, or the premise of it is where you can do mining basically on hard drives and solid state drives. So during the last couple of years, part of the contribution to the supply chain shortage for hard drives and solid state drives was people just buying up the hard drives and solid state drives to do geo cryptocurrency mining. This was a story basically a year ago. Scaleway, which is a cloud storage provider in France, basically told its clients saying, hey, if you cannot do chia plotting in our data centers because you are destroying and just burning up our solid state drives in under a few weeks. So these solid state drives last two weeks and then they were burned out. So they were going to charge their people if they found that they were burning up their solid state drives. So last year we had a global storage media and computing supply chain shortage. Any of you or your IT departments or anybody trying to go out and buy drives or buying supplies, you probably found a long backlog <laughs> of, of orders. Uh, one of them was the microchip and semiconductor shortage, which was last spring. Basically, as I mentioned before, it is water intensive. You need purified water to manufacture them. There was the, a drought, a very severe drought in Taiwan, which manufactures many of the microchips and semiconductors, which caused a slowdown in production. In fact, residents in Taiwan, they had to ration their water so that the manufacturing plants could still create the microchips to keep it going. There is a shortage of hard drives and solid state drives in the Chia cryptocurrency use, as I just said in the previous slide. Now, as of this month, there appears to be a supply correction, but as there are more droughts around the world, there will be continued shortages. Then we have the third type of storage media, which is data storage tape or LTO, which has the largest market share. Now, the electricity use can be low, medium, or none, because if you write data to a data tape and then you just put it on a shelf, it's just going to sit there quietly waiting for you to use it again. So it's not using any energy. Uh, its life expectancy is 30 years, according to manufacturers, but really you're going to move that data, migrate the data off a tape to another generation, like two to three generations down the road. It does have some potential of recyclable parts, the plastic, the screws. Again, though, you have to take it apart to do it. There is no process yet to separate the mylar ribbon, which is recyclable from the metal particle or the barium ferrite that holds the data. There isn't a process yet to do it. So essentially what's happening with data tape is it gets shredded and incinerated. If you want to recycle your drives, your LTOs, your other e-waste at certified e-waste facilities, which will do this responsibly, these are the two websites to go to to find a, a location near you. And the, these are international resources. There's e-stewards and R2. So for example, I searched for uh, what facilities here in LA where we can recycle our um, e-waste. And there are 18 here. There are also, there's cloud storage that you might be thinking about where basically you're storing your files in other people's servers. Nice thing about cloud storage is you pay for what you use. You don't need to purchase hardware. So there's no organizational storage e-waste. There is economies of scale. That, that's the potential here where it, it, the cloud provider provides the hardware for you. It has the power, it's the air conditioning and it's serving many, many organizations under its roof. 
Uh, you also don't need to keep buying the hardware, which becomes e-waste, the electricity use maybe is optimized, it depends on the particular data center. And the nice thing about cloud storage obviously is collections access can be global, not just local. Some organizations and businesses are saying, well, as part of our carbon neutral strategy, we're going to use cloud storage. Well, what that means is you're using someone else's carbon. It's the data center is using still carbon. Um, so just, it's still your content. You are still responsible for it. Because consider the cloud vendor's power source. Is it dirty? Most of the data, most of the electricity powering these data centers is dirty. Data centers use 3% of the world's electricity. This is going to only go only going to increase. The major cloud service providers are moving towards 100% renewable energy. There, some of them are even building their own wind and solar farms, which will power their dedicated data centers and also to supply their neighbors in the area. But the reality is most of their servers are in third-party data centers. They're renting space. You can go to this map here and you can just point, you can actually do nice searches here by country and by location to find out where are the data centers that are around you. Um, so you can see here globally, some of the areas obviously like Russia uh, hasn't said, and China hasn't said really where all their data centers are, but um, this gives you a sense of how many around the world. So what are the energy sources for the data centers and basically your uh, resources? What kind of energy is it? Well, this grid, this comes from the US Energy Information Administration. Just looking here and you can see the nice thing is, is that coal is really decreasing um, and investors are seeing that investors are giving more money into renewable energy energies. They see the writing on the wall, less coal so much, but there's still a large percentage of this is all greenhouse gas emissions. Um, hydroelectric, I have circled there. Hydroelectric source of power is very important, but droughts are caused, droughts that are being caused by climate change threaten the hydroelectricity output. So just thinking here in LA this week, uh, the water management district has said, okay, it's really drought, you know, people, we have to cut back and we're all going to be forced to cut back on water. You know, the data center where we have our operations, you know, they all need to have water to cool for their chillers to cool, keep the data center cool. So what is the shortage in water going to, how is that going to impact chilling these data centers, not just to mention the power? So keeping in mind all this energy use, the e-waste potential, what again can archives and individuals do to mitigate your environmental impact with all of this data that you're taking care of? and how can we decrease our carbon shadows? So here are some of the possible things you could think about doing and taking back to your organizations. So one of them is thinking about the technology is using less energy. That would seem to be an obvious thing you can do. This is related to the storage because using less electricity, fewer spinning disks helps the environment and it also then saves you money if you have an on-site data center so you can apply hierarchical storage management or HSM policies. Essentially what this means is you store your large and infrequently accessed files offline on data tape and you only store the frequently accessed files online, which would be on spinning disk. That would be tier one. So thinking again about the statistics for about um, how much data there is in the world and how half of it is stored in the public cloud. And pretty much it's like most of the data isn't in constant use. If it's, and so it is being recommended in IT industries. Well, you know, store your infrequently accessed data off on, I'm sorry, offline. It doesn't need to be online where it uses more energy and is more expensive. Spinning disk storage takes 26 times more energy than just storing your large and infrequently files offline on data tape. So what's HSM? So it has three tiers. Tier one is the online, that's your immediate access from spinning disk or solid state drives. Tier two, that's near line, which means it can be stored on tape in a tape robot in a larger environment where the files are accessed from tape or you can store files on hard drives and tier one then is on fast solid state drives. Tier three is offline. It's stored on tape or hard drives that are stored on, on media off the network. It's not plugged in. 
most archives and libraries, they would be using tier one and tier three. And basically, if you are using cloud storage providers, when they talk about, you know, the most expensive storage is the storage that they have on spinning disk or hard drives, then they go through a couple of tiers. And so the, the lowest storage is really the lowest cost storage is what they're storing offline. And the dirty secret is it's, it's on data tape, even though they don't tell you, but it is. And so then that's why it's most expensive for you to retrieve the data from cloud storage because that data is stored on tape that they have to have put into a robot and then it's restored to send back to you. So if you think about it carefully, cloud storage could be part of HSM policies where let's say, for example, you put the files that you need immediate access to online in the cloud, but everything else is stored offline. You don't need to have it up there in the cloud. Keeping with the same thought of using less energy, if you store data on data tape, LTO, especially for your larger or not frequently accessed data as your backup, only migrate every two or even three generations, as long as you still have the means, the drives and the infrastructure to restore the files from the um, older generations and to put it to new, new generations. Now, just thinking about that more files will be stored on the new generation tape, because as with each generation, there's more storage that's possible on it. So for example, LTO seven tape generation, that's two generations back can store. It says six, but it's really 5.2 terabytes. LTO eight, it says it can store like 12 terabytes, but it's really 10.2 terabytes on it. So um, as you can see, that's a double in storage. So you can get more data on one storage media, which is helpful. Unfortunately, you're going to have to recycle. You cannot recycle old data tape because there is the means to do that yet. And so basically you're going to be most likely shredding and incinerating it, which is why it's important for you to know about the appropriate recycling vendors. You can also, if you have a server room, if you're on site and you're running current hardware, you don't need to keep it as cold as it used to be in the past. It can be kept to 70 to 74 degrees, even up to 81 degrees Fahrenheit, some data centers. You just have to be um, careful about it. Rooms with data tape can be at a different, uh, rooms where you're storing data tape can be at a different temperature, different environment. So using less energy, you can turn off unused servers. If you're not using them, they don't need to be powered up. Set the servers to go into inactive mode if they're not in use. You can consolidate and virtualize several applications on one server. So instead of buying a bunch of servers, you know, one for each application, depending on what it is, obviously, you can do virtualization. You can use the cloud for some applications, but just, you know, be mindful about who you're using and try to verify the green record. And if you're using a co-location center, so basically you're renting space, your organization is renting space out of a data center, just find out what's the power source, what's the green record, how careful are they being about trying to lower their impact. Planning, uh, purchase clean energy where it's possible, if you can, uh, not coal generated. Purchase hardware that is energy efficient. I'm sure most of you are already doing that anyway. Purchase recycled devices. So for uh, recycled materials, recycled by reuse. You can upgrade your servers by upgrading the drives inside them, not necessarily the entire box. You know, keep the box, just upgrade the drives, the storage on the drives. Recycle by reuse when possible. And if you have to recycle data tape and hard drives, Make sure that you use vendors, if you can, who strip out the parts and recycle it. So especially hard drives, you now know where you can go to try to have your old drives to be recycled. Um, if you have to shred it and incinerate it, verify the incineration process, look at those two links that I gave you to try to find a facility near you. Now your preservation actions. You're supposed to do fixity checks. You know, fixity check meaning you are verifying that the bits on those files are still healthy, that nothing has changed. This, of course, your schedule for and how often you check the files to make sure they're okay depends on how the files are being stored. Are they stored online? It's easier to do if they are offline, if they're on data tape and the storage media is just sitting there waiting for you. You don't need to perform it more than say once a year, sometimes even twice a year. 
because running fixity checks takes CPU power, it takes memory, it takes storage, and all of that is running on electricity. So you can just be thoughtful in planning how often you do fixity checks. Appraisal policies. Do you need to keep everything forever? All this digital content. And yeah, it's so difficult, I know. It's where you have so much data coming in and it's hard to really know what is it. And so you just wind up keeping everything because it takes more time just to appraise it and figure out what you want to keep. But try to do it. Know what you're getting before it comes in. You know, decide if you do you need to keep it forever. If you retain it for a specific period that isn't necessarily permanent, then you can move files between storage tiers and then ultimately delete it. Does all of the content that you are acquiring or created, does it need to be digitized or saved at the highest possible resolution? Because high resolution makes large files, which means large amount of storage to manage. So if you do want to have it at the highest possible resolution, then store the permanent large preservation masters offline. They do not need to be on spinning disk or on storage media that um, is constantly powered up. Now, low resolution digital files are better than nothing. If you decide though to not do your digitization at the highest level, because you have limited resources, you have a budget, just save the content. You know, that's, that's the most important thing, save it. Just be sure that whatever format and resolution that you are digitizing it at, that it is sustainable, it's widely used, it's supported, it can be migrated or emulated in the future. Then thinking about our human extra archival actions, what did we learn from these past three years? How can we reduce our climate shadow? So we have learned how to work from home as much as possible because that's less transit use, less automobile emissions, and the less oil and gas use is less demand. And basically, again, the investors who are investing in energy and coal or renewables, they're going to say, oh, people don't want oil, they don't want fossil fuels, they want renewables, so they'll invest in renewables. Hold remote conferences or as hybrid events, as we're doing right now. We're having a Zoom, even though we all want to see each other, but a lot of conferences are now moving to hybrid um, events where people can participate uh, remotely through Zoom as well as be in person, because online events are more environmentally friendly than in person. So I think we're going to see in the next coming years, you know, as we're all adapting to this new post-pandemic world, um, actually these hybrid events where, yes, we have the opportunity to see people whom we love and appreciate and want to get to know and meet again. On the other hand, more people can participate also by having these remote conferences. So hopefully you will go back to your organizations, you will, you'll have a copy of the slides, you'll have resources. There is also this um, nice resource here that was developed by the folks who wrote the article that was in the American Archivist a couple of years ago toward environmentally sustainable digital preservation. And they created workshop uh, documents that you, materials that you can use to stir conversations um, at your organization. So again, you'll have links to these in your slides. So I thank you so much for taking the time and uh, and I look forward to, let's have a conversation. We have some time left. So I'm going to stop sharing and turn video back on. Yes, thank you, Linda, for a wonderful, very interesting and timely presentation. Uh, as a reminder to everybody, uh, when you get the chance, uh, you can use the Q&A uh, feature in Zoom to ask your questions. I do have a couple in here, uh, which we can we can start with. Um, but please, as we're talking, feel free to type in your questions as they come to you. Um, Linda, why don't we start with uh, this one? Uh, throughout history, some of the biggest advancements happened out of need or desperation. Have you come across any new storage methods or ways to preserve digital artifacts that are emerging? due to the ongoing shortages kicked off by the pandemic? Yes, and actually it was pre to the pandemic. So one of the storage, new storage technologies that I am hoping is going to actually succeed is DNA storage. 
DNA data use. Now, DNA is not biological DNA. It's not, it's not humans are not taking like your DNA and putting putting bits into it. But they're they're emulating through the technologies, you know, that are in our bodies. What I actually find fascinating, just philosophically, is how so many of these storage technologies that are being developed or ways for renewables are impacting how our bodies work. Um, so DNA data storage and actually um, you know, I just joined the DNA Data Storage Alliance, which is working towards creating interoperable da uh, DNA data storage technologies. Because one of the problems is, is as they're writing data to DNA capsules, you know, one procedure does it that way, you can't read it in another. Well, that's not going to fly, you know, for preservation or for anything. They have. There has to be interoperability. And so I'm very excited to be participating in that conversation on that technology because those little capsules can hold petabytes and petabytes and petabytes of data, multiple petabytes of data in this one little thing. And it can just be stored in an office environment. It doesn't require cold storage at all. Um, it has a lot of potential. It's very expensive to do right now. One of the issues, which I'm looking forward to hearing more R&D work on, is about random access. So let's say you just store petabytes of data in this one little capsule. What if you just want one document off of it, you know, one small little bit of it? You have to, right now you'd have to restore all that petabytes of data to find that one little itty bitty file. So they have to fix that, but they will because they know they have to. And the nice thing about the storage is that it does not use hard, you know, materials. It doesn't use rare earth materials. So that's where my hope is: is that that's where we're ultimately going to be going to in the future. Thrilling and cutting edge, uh, very interesting. I've got another question for you here uh, that is about uh, applying practically some of the recommendations you made. Uh, how do individuals use tape for backup? Can we actually buy tape drives for individual use? Yes, you can. So, um, okay, so if you get in, and you can just get a single drive. You don't have to have these huge robotic systems. You can just get a single drive, you plug it into your computer, you know, you just have to have like a, a special like a SAS connection to do it. So you can, you can get, if your computer doesn't have it, your workstation doesn't have it, you can get that kind of adapter. But there are, uh, you know, just basically go online and look for like LTO8 drives and just looking for a single one. And it costs around $3,500, let's say right now somewhere around that area. And then an LTO8 data tape might be like $70, but you're storing 10 terabytes of data on that one tape, that one data tape. So it's very cost effective. You just have to be sure that you are writing it, not in a proprietary backup system. So it gets to be kind of complex. Yeah, you can get the devices, but how do you write the data to it? You wanna make sure that, I'm sorry to go too much in the weeds here, but you want to make sure that you can write using LTFS, linear tape, open file system, which is an open standard for writing data. And so basically that tape, you know, the drive plugged on to, into your computer looks just like you have a hard drive plugged in. You see the file structure is right there exactly as you wrote it. And um, you can access the files that way if you need to access them again after you copy them off. So just make sure that it's, it's in this open system so that you're not locked into any proprietary backup system. That's a no-no, because then you are locked into that proprietary system forever until you restore the files off out of that system and put it into a more open system. Oh, well, that's great to know that LTO is within reach for the individual, and that's a good tip about LTFS. Um, I've got another question here. I'll handle the first one because it's a little logistical. And the question is, can you share the links to where responsible recyclers can be found? Uh, this is a good uh, opportunity just to just remind everybody that you're going to get the PowerPoint slides after the presentation with those links in them. Uh, but the second question is, uh, I have uh, brought e-waste to our local Best Buy. Is this a responsible solution? Um, to our local, what was it? Oh, Best Buy. Oh, Best Buy. Oh, okay. Uh, you don't know what Best Buy does with it, to tell you the truth. I mean, you drop it there and you think you're doing the right thing. What are they doing? And so e-waste, I'm assuming, because that Best Buy is more, uh, is focused on consumer products. So cables, you know, they know what to do with the cables, you know, maybe optical media, like old CDs, DVDs, if they're still receiving those. But you're not going to give them hard drives or solid state drives. 
they don't know what to do with that. They're really more focused on the consumer type, um, you know, accessories, paraphernalia around, electron around electronics. If you really want to recycle a hard drive or a solid state drive or your computers or anything like that, please look at those sources that, um, that, I, that I gave you in the PowerPoint. And, and also don't forget if you are a consumer and you have hard drives, you know, HP, Dell, you know, they're all, you know, look at those links as well. That might be an easier way for you to return some of the uh, more sophisticated electronics, you know, rather than going to Best Buy. Okay, good to know. Um, we have another question here. It may have been asked before you went into um, the opportunities for recycling certain data storage carriers. Um, but I'll, I'll ask it anyway, and if you have anything to add or reinforce, I think that might be helpful to everyone. Um, are there currently any environmentally friendly or recyclable data storage carriers on the market? Um, okay, it's a, it's a by carriers, you're talking about storage carriers, so it's going to be hard drive, solid state drive, or data tape? Mm -hmm. is, it, is that it? Okay. It's, it's really a trade-off. You know, that's the thing. So you can think about, okay, hard drives, you know, the manufacturers are, it's in their best interest to figure out ways to recycle it. So basically there are really only three hard drives manufacturers, even though they might be labeled something else, you know, is Western Digital, it's Seagate and Toshiba. Those are the three companies that are making all the hard drives that are used around the world, regardless of what other label might be put on it. So they're the ones who are really looking at how can we reclaim the magnets and the aluminum and anything else. They're, they're leading that R&D effort. Solid state drives, again, I'm not sure about recycling those. And the data tape, the LTO tape. So the trade-off is spinning disk takes more energy, but there's more established reclamation research that's being done on it. Data tape uses the least amount of energy so on one hand, you think, oh, that's good. I can just do that. I can sit on the shelf, doesn't use any energy, but there's no recycling potential for it because they haven't really developed recycling means, you know, to get the mylar off, to scrape off the magnetic material, to recycle even the plastic or the screws. They, the data tape just gets shredded and incinerated. So it's really that no bottom line is there is no one perfect storage medium. It's really a trade-off. You have to think about your environment and what, so usually you might think about mixing up the different storage media if you can, you know, using hard drives that you know can be recycled, using data tape that can't be recycled, but you can store it offline and it doesn't take energy. Okay, very helpful. I uh, Now, let me see if we have any other questions coming in. Um, we do not have any other questions at the moment. Um, so please feel free to ask uh, through the Q&A box if you have more. I do have one question uh, that I'm, I'm curious about. Um, so if you are an institution trying to um, sort of understand more about their, you know, your own energy consumption, are there best practices for trying to quantify that energy uh, use for your, your archival collections? And then that might help one sort of create a metric for improvement over time. Um, look and see that, that last the last slide that I had, there are workshop elements there. So you can look at that. The other thing is, so data centers. And so if you work with your IT team, which I'm assuming that if you're at an organization, you're storing a lot of data, you might be working, you might already have an on-premise data center. I mean, if you're at a university or an archive, you have servers there. You know, they're storing a lot of local data, even if some of it's in the cloud. So there's a, um, a, a standard that data centers use to, to monitor their energy consumption. And the acronym for that is PUE. And so ideally what you want to have that down is to be one and less than one. And that number one means like the energy that you are generating is equal to what you are bringing in. So basically, you know, it's, it's you know, zeros itself out. Ideally, what you even want to have is the less than one, because that means, for example, if you are using energy that is renewable energy, then, you know, it doesn't matter how much energy you're using because it's all created from renewables. And so you could look to see like, okay, how are those metrics determined? You can go online, just look at PUE data center, and then it will give you some guidance on then, okay, how do you 
monitor that because there are all these different factors for energy use. It's not just what you're bringing in. It's also what's the energy to spin everything. It's the energy being used for the, um, the chilling. You know, as I was mentioning before, you have to keep things cool. You know, on a machine room, the machines have to be kept cool. They need to be happy so that they run and don't burn out and you lose all your data, which is bad. So anyway, so um, yeah, so I would recommend uh, talk to your IT people. Think about the PUE metrics to determine that. Um, go and somebody just put some best things for the SAA electronics section. Elizabeth England said, OK, so Elizabeth, thank you. And so she's just writing some other information in the chat where you can look. Great, and I had not known about PUE. That is uh, great information to share. Um, I do have one uh, one other question that's just come in. Uh, of those three storage options that you talked about, uh, could you speak a bit about the energy used to create them? Yeah. So excellent point. So you have to think. So exactly. So you have to think about the manufacturing. So of all of them, it would be the. Okay, so solid state drives, as I was mentioning, those those also, be, uh, all the microchips that go into it, those require purified water to create the purified water uses energy use. There are all these different parts that go into making it. You have the, um, the magnets that are used in hard drives. So the material used to create the magnets, they tend to come from China or from Australia or from, um, from uh, from other countries, but those are the two primary ones. Then you have to think about the cobalt that is used, and cobalt is actually mainly being mined in the Republic of Congo, where there are actually conflicts there because of warring factions, which are, and they're using child labor, so you have to think about all of that as well. So cobalt, which pretty much just comes from that area, and there's so the, so other manufacturers are trying to figure out if there are other resources for cobalt around the world where there's less of a conflict. So there's so many different um, parts, you know, the the energy use, where are all the parts, where are all the elements coming from, from around the world, and how are those being mined, you know, um, the manufacturing process, once all of those parts are brought in together to be manufactured, it is very energy intensive, you know, and then all those parts have to get shipped to the manufacturers that are creating all these elements. So there, yeah. That is a helpful walkthrough that I feel like really emphasizes the um, the impact of the uh, the supply chain, where everything's coming from, uh, and how that you know influences the consumption of energy that goes into our digital storage. So thank you. Um, now we have time for one last question. I don't see any in the chat. I'm going to pause for just a moment uh, to allow any lingering questions to come in. We can answer one of them, and we will be able to answer other questions that come in that we can't get to. Um, Linda has kindly offered to answer those uh, via email afterwards. Um, so I'm going to take a moment and just let the chat box or the, the Q&A box uh, roll for a minute. I do have one last question that's come in. I've caught it in the chat. Um, and the, the question is, um, where could you uh, go to, or like what type of degree and what type of schooling could one acquire uh, to gain more knowledge in digital preservation and its impact on the environment? What type of schooling could you do to prepare yourself to be more involved in this space? Well, as far as a degree, I'm not aware of any specific degree in this particular topic. Hopefully, if you are studying digital preservation, you know, within an archives program or, or information studies library science program, they will be bringing up these topics in digital preservation, um, hopefully. Um, I know I do in my class. <laughs> my students get it banged over the head. <laughs> so. Um, there's been a lot of work in this area and on data centers and technology um, out of some universities in Canada, actually. Uh, there's actually more happening in Canada than there is in far this kind of study than there is in the U.S. Um, yeah, so as far as I know, there is no degree program. It's just incorporated, hopefully, into other programs. Well, thanks so much for participating in such a rich Q&A. Um, I'm going to now wind us down and share my final screens and offer again one uh, last round of thanks uh, for just a great presentation. 
Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for, for joining this. Thank you. Okay, well, we are glad you could be with us today. You will soon receive a short online evaluation form. Please take a few minutes to respond to the questions. Your comments are very valuable and help the core continuing education committee plan future events. The email will also include links to today's slides and recording. Uh, thank you again to our presenter, Linda Tadich. And thanks also to members of the continuing education committee, Catherine Balick, and Julie Reese, Tom Farron, and Nia Blitz Sheehan from the core office. Uh, the support they provide makes it possible for us to present these webinars. Now, ALA core is seeking new members. Join core for access to past webinars and many other benefits. Uh, visit ala.org slash core for more information on membership. Additionally, we have a new Preservation Week website. Visit us at preservationweek.org for recordings of past webinars, preservation resources, and help planning a Preservation Week event at your library. CORE has other continuing education events coming up. The next webinar will be Tuesday, May 3rd on Zotero, teaching and supporting in libraries. Uh, please see the CORE website to register or find more information on this and other upcoming webinars. Now, CORE offers web courses, which are four to six weeks long. The next two courses will cover fundamentals of preservation and fundamentals of digital library projects. CORE also offers two-day email discussions and a new classroom series of workshops. The next e-forum will be May 17th and 18th on giving the one shot your best shot, making the most of one shot instruction. Now, thank you all for joining us today. This concludes our session.